Welcome back to Your Health Television program. I'm Dr. David Morwood. I am a board-certified plastic surgeon, and I'm very pleased you could be with me for this next third segment on today's edition of Your Health. I'd like to take a few minutes to discuss the natural neck lift. Neck rejuvenation, or neck lifting, neck liposuction, many different procedures that we can use to create a more uh, firmer, tighter, crisper neckline, uh, are all part of what I call the natural neck lift. And of course, in my practice, uh, it's a commonly performed procedure. I get a lot of requests for neck rejuvenation. And in fact, it seems to me in some months and some seasons, I perform more neck lifts than I do face lifts. I can do, I sometimes do more neck rejuvenation procedures, whether it's simple liposuction or a formal platysmoplasty, than I will for a facelift. I think for both men and women, a clean, crisp, uh, firm neck and jawline is really a sign of strength and beauty uh, and youth, and it gives people a much more vibrant look, and they feel much better about themselves with a cleaner, crisper neckline. Oftentimes, uh, especially for men, many, uh, a lot of my men patients or male patients, uh, they're not really interested in changing the appearance of their face but they would like to create a, a more cleaner, crisper neckline. So what I'd like to do is take a few minutes to talk about options and how we come up with a plan for a natural neck lift. Now in my office, what I typically do is start in the consultation. I like to sit with a person in front of a mirror. I hand them a mirror and I ask them to point out to me specifically what they might want to, ch what they might want to change and I listen to them carefully and examine them. I think during the examination, what's important is to key, on, key in on is the anatomy because for plastic surgery especially, and almost all the surgical specialties, uh, and a pertinent and accurate knowledge of the anatomy is really key and really the foundation in how we start to formulate a good surgical plan. So again, we need an accurate knowledge and assessment of the anatomy before we formulate a plan to affect the anatomy and formulate a surgical plan. So we need to go layer by layer, structure by structure, doing an analysis of what's there. And of, as I said, I listen to the patient about what they want, what they would like to change. I need to know about their general health, if they're on any medicines, is their blood pressure controlled, are they diabetic? Have they had any prior procedures to alter their neck appearance or their skin appearance? Uh, that's all very important uh, in, in, taking a, in the course of taking a history and during the exam. So let's return to this concept of anatomic evaluation and assessment. I need to look at the skin, of course. Now the skin of the neck is different than the skin of the face. We need to be very careful when we talk about skin resurfacing in the neck. The skin of the face has uh, many more secondary appendages like sebaceous glands and sweat glands, et cetera, uh, and is much more, uh, has more, is more hirsute, has more hair than the skin of the neck. So we need to be very careful with procedures such as laser and deeper TCA peels, for example. A TCA peel is something that I like to do a fair amount uh, in the office and in the operating room, but we need to be very careful when we resurface the skin of the neck because it lacks, it, there's a relative lack of those secondary appendages. But it's important to look at the quality of the skin. Is there extra skin? Is there redundant skin? Does the skin that's there have resilience or is it stretched out or sun damaged? Any of you who have come to my, any of you who have come to any of my seminars, know that I'm a big believer in skin care and facials, and I think that good skin care is the beginning of any skin treatment or any skin rejuvenation program, and I really believe in that, and that that goes for the neck as well, in addition to the face. So first of all, we look at the skin. Uh, as I've said in the past, the skin has two major layers: the epidermis and the dermis. The epidermis is what we see. And that's where we get the appearance of, uh, are there a presence of pigment? Is there dispigmentation? Are there so-called age spots or sunspots? So that the very epidermal layer, the very superficial layer, uh, can tell us a lot about, or it's the key to the appearance of the skin by and large. However, the business 
layer is really the dermis. That's right under the epidermis. The dermis is where the blood supply is. It's where the strength is. It's where the collagen is. The collagen is the basic building protein block uh, of the body, not just the skin and the dermis, but of the body. So we need to look at the, the skin, the epidermis, and the dermis, keeping in mind that the business end is not really, or the business layer is not really what we can see. The dermis is just under the epidermis. That's, that's the second layer. It's, it's the dermis. Now, under the dermis is the subcutaneous fatty layer. This is a very important layer when we consider neck rejuvenation. For some people, all they have is redundant adipose or redundant fat that I can oftentimes treat with liposuction. To do liposuction of the neck, I make a very small incision in the submental crease. About 90% of Americans that I meet in my office already have a scar under their chin from a childhood accident when they fell from their bike or tripped on the stairs or fell onto a curb. So usually a very small incision in the submental crease underneath the chin doesn't usually bother people. I make a second and third incision where the earlobe meets the cheek one on each side, so a total of three incisions, and through those incisions I can insert a cannula. A cannula is a tube, I attach the tube to suction, and I can vacuum out lots of fat cells, and I can mold and shape and tailor while I do that. So it's important to keep in mind that liposuction is not for everyone, but for the patient who does not have a lot of lax or redundant muscle, and for the patient whose skin is resilient, it can be a very effective way to uh, smooth out the neckline to make it crisper and cleaner and that can be effective. Uh, in general that's for people with not extra skin or that's for pe liposuction is for people who have a fair amount of skin resilience in the neck. Liposuction can be very effective. It's a very important tool. Next I look at the amount of skin. If someone has extra skin and there's too much skin there then it needs to be either removed or repositioned. Now, we need to distinguish between skin that has descended from gravity, in other words, come down from where it, it, it used to be above the jawline and has come down to below the jawline. We need to distinguish that then from skin that started out in the neck anyway and has lost its resilience and is hanging and being affected by the gravity. If there's redundant skin or a loss of resilience, then that skin either needs to be re repositioned, redraped, tightened to some degree, or removed. How do I remove extra skin from the neck? Well, in general, very small amounts of skin from the submental area can be removed with a little incision in the submental crease. But for more complex or invasive uh, maneuvers, I make incisions uh, in front of the ear under and around the earlobe and to the behind the ear, that's called a retroauricular crease, and sometimes across the bone that's behind the ear, that's called the mastoid, and then into the hair or just at the hairline. Through those axis incisions, I can dissect down, tighten muscles, uh, remove extra skin, uh, remove some fat, etc. So those can be very valuable, very helpful incisions to be made around the ears when I'm trying to gain access to the neck. In addition to the submental incision that I make in the crease under the chin. So we've talked about the skin. I need to evaluate whether or not the skin has resilience. Is there extra skin? I need to look at the, the fatty layer, the subcutaneous tissue. Uh, does fat need to be removed? I do not like to remove all the fat, of course, because some fat uh, is desired. Some fat under the chin and in the neck is desired. We don't want a skeletonized or overly dissected or overly thin appearing neck. That leads to a cachectic, unnatural appearance. Next, I look at what's called the platysma muscle. The platysma muscle is oftentimes the culprit of the bands underneath the neck. Sometimes people will come in and they grab the tissue under their neck and they say, doctor, I have this turkey waddle or this turkey neck, too much extra skin, all this fat, can you remove the extra skin and fat? Where the truth is, is that the muscle underneath the fatty layer, that's called a platysmal, it's lax. When those muscle bands get lax, they tend to be more affected by gravity and they tend to hang or to descend. When what we really want, of course, is, is for the neckline, the muscles to be crisp and clean and adherent to the deeper structures, uh, deeper within the neck, of course. So a platysmoplasty, 
can be done through the submental incision. That's where I make an incision in that same crease, and I go in and I address those bands either with either with the so-called pants over vest maneuver when I tighten them up uh, and one one atop another with sutures. I can shore them up. Sometimes we divide the bands. Um, sometimes we manipulate them through different ways. But those are all ways that we can do a platysmoplasty. Sometimes I just shore them up with a suture midline. I can uh, tie them together, bring them together with sutures. And that can be, depending upon the presentation and the person's anatomy, that can be a very effective way of treating those platysmal bands. Now, there can be some subplatysmal fat that we can address directly. Sometimes the normal submaxillary or submandibular glands are quite prominent in some people and they can be addressed surgically. Uh, but oftentimes when a person has a quite a bit of, of a lax platysma, I not only address it midline through the submental incision, but I also like to come from the side. Uh, I, I would say it's a rare time, a rare occurrence when I address the platysma muscle only through a midline or submental approach. So oftentimes what I will do is try to create a, a sort of a hammock phenomena where I tighten up the muscles in the midline and then I, that's the platysma I tighten up in the midline, then I come from the side through those incisions behind the ears and I can transpose the platysma back where it should be. There are also procedures during something called a short scar approach or a short scar facelift where I can take the very uh, superior or cranial lateral margin of the platysma and transpose it up like that um, back, in, back toward the cheek where it belongs and avoid a lot of the, a lot of the midline platysmoplasty work. There's another approach that we can do is, and that's called the direct neck lift uh, in the submental area where I actually make an incision under the chin and through that incision there going sort of in the sagittal plane as opposed to transversely going in that other plane where I can remove fat, I can tighten up lipatisma, and I can remove skin. Now that does leave a scar. Usually we try to keep that scar shorter and then in the face forward view when people are in repose or looking level uh, that scar is not obvious. And of course, scars tend to fade. Although they can be unpredictable, scars tend to fade with time. I always tell people in my office, even though I'm a plastic surgeon, every time I make an incision, it will leave a scar, a permanent visible scar. But we never judge a scar for six to 12 months. Now, there's another step in the analysis that I like to do, and that's to evaluate the deeper structures. In other words, evaluate the foundation. I look at the actual jawline itself. I look at the jaw. And I look at the position of the chin. For both men and women in our society to have a harmonious, balanced face, including a moderately prominent chin, can be a very valuable adjunct in neck rejuvenation. So at certain times, I will recommend a silastic chin implant to give a, a more, more of a volume and improve the contour of the chin. And at other times, I'll recommend what's called a bony genioplasty. That's where we bring the actual chin forward. And I do that through an incision in the mouth. So it doesn't leave a lot of scars on the outside. Uh, it doesn't leave obvious scars. So I go in and I divide the bone at the proper place below the teeth level, uh, of, below the dental roots. I avoid these nerves called the mental nerves, which come out just below the canine teeth. Those nerves need to be identified and preserved so I can divide the bone across at a certain level and I can advance the, ch the chin bone itself. That's called a bony genioplasty. And then I fix it uh, rigidly, either with wires or plate and screws. And that can be done uh, in the operating room on an outpatient basis. It sounds sort of like complicated surgery. It needs to be done carefully but again, it's, we're not going into the throat, we're not going into the pharynx. It's just this tissue here. We're really affecting the chin and the chin bone just under the soft tissue. So that can be a very effective adjunct to improve the, uh, the whole entire appearance of the neck as well as the uh, jawline and the chin itself. Now, a silastic chin implant can be done through a small incision in the submental crease and that is similar to other type of implants that we use. It's firm silicone. It goes on top 
of the chin bone. And it's a, perhaps a more simple way to provide extra volume and projection for the chin. So again, for an effective uh, natural neck lift, we need to look anatomically. We need to go layer by layer, examine the skin, uh, look at the fatty layer, look at the platysma muscle, and of course look at the foundation of the structures. And we need to plan out, plan out our incisions, uh, whether it should be done under local anesthesia in the office or whether it requires a general anesthetic or a more intense sedation at the surgery center or the hospital. And of course, we like to base our approach on what a person wants, what is that person's concern, where do they want to go, keeping in mind their health, how much time can they take off, uh, et cetera. So those are all components to what I like to refer to as the natural neck lift. If you'd like more information about the natural neck lift or any other uh, topic in surgery, I'm Dr. D in plastic surgery, I'm Dr. David Morwood. My office is here in Monterey. I'm at 831-646-8661. That's 831-646-8661. Or go to drmorwood.com, D-R-M-O-R-W-O-O-D, drmorwood.com. Once again, thank you very much for joining, joining us today on Your Health television program. I'm Dr. David Morwood. I am a board-certified plastic surgeon. I'm very pleased you could be with us. Please tune in again.